SJC 12636, Commonwealth v. Denver Petit Homme. Mr. Crane, good morning. Good morning. May it please the court, Edward Crane on behalf of Denver Petit Home. <clears throat> the question raised here is whether the immigration warning required by Rule 12AC3B is materially the same as the immigration warning required by GLC 278, Section 29D, such that the 3B warning can excuse an omission of the 29D warning. It's a defendant's position that the two warnings are materially different in scope. The 3B warning advises defendants that if they are pleading to an offense that presumptively mandates removal, then deportation, exclusion from admission, or denial of naturalization. Talk a little louder, sorry. My apologies. Is practically inevitable. This warning specifically conditions the risk of immigration consequences on the fact that the offense is one that presumptively mandates removal. In contrast, the 29D warning is far more broad and does not condition the risk of immigration consequences on any one fact. Great. How, do, how do we factor in the part that the trial judge, or the motion judge, rather, or the plea judge, I'm sorry, asked specifically about immigration to, to, to counsel, and counsel said we, we discussed it. There was some, other than the warnings which, you, which you're raising, there was some discussion with Judge Grant about immigration consequences, true? The only thing that I can recall from the, the plea transcript is- I thought they uh, said it in the plea. There was a, re there was a question to uh, plea counsel as to whether uh, she had discussed generally um, the collateral consequences of the plea, and she said yes. I thought this is, is again, we, we have so many of these, I wanna make sure I'm not confused. In fact, this is the case where he said he wasn't governed by the warnings, right? That he was, he was born in the United States, right? Yes, he did say. So he, mis he affirmatively misleads the judge about what his status is? Yes, he did. D dur during the colloquy? During the colloquy, he, he stated that he understood English and that he was born here. And, and that, was that isn't correct. I think he also said that he understood the possible immigration uh, consequences in the colloquy, as I remember it, and obviously not uh, in and of itself enough he signed the green sheet acknowledging the, um, the uh, 29D uh, warning, that he, that he understood it. Yes, and with respect to the 29D warning being on the written uh, plea sheet, I think that Commonwealth v. Hilaire is um, basically controlling with respect to that issue. Um, in, in Hilaire, the defendant signed three different plea sheets that said that uh, he understood the 29D warning. Yet the court in Hilaire, and I think it's the greater point from Hilaire is that the, the defendant's understanding, his actual understanding of immigration consequences is irrelevant with respect to a 29D analysis. <clears throat> it's certainly relevant with respect to a Padilla, Padilla analysis, but when um, the claim is made under 29D, um, the defendant's actual understanding is irrelevant to the analysis. And I, again, I think Hilaire makes that clear because the defendant in Hilaire, Hilaire clearly did understand the um, actual consequences. Well, I think, I think that we have cases uh, saying that the precise language used is not the key, including um, Commonwealth versus uh, Lemrini. Um, it, it's the question of whether or not the defendant was warned adequately of the guilty plea, and the, and the green sheet signature is just not going to do it. But that doesn't mean that if you take the constellation of things that happen in this case, that that doesn't go, go into uh, determining whether it was enough. Well, I think that it, it, though it, the analysis has to focus on whether the warning from the judge provided what is required by 29D. If, if we go further, I, I think we, and, and say, okay, we can, look at all of the, say, the totality of the circumstances. We can look at everything involved um, to look at whether the defendant understood the immigration consequences of his plea. Then I think we run into real trouble here with a 29D analysis. I don't see how a defendant could ever win on a 29D analysis without first winning on a Padilla 
analysis. And I think the court could, um, could say, well, we're going to presume that your counsel here was not ineffective and that counsel informed you about immigration consequences. So how could, um, in, in, that, in that situation, how could a defendant ever win on the 29D analysis? Now, I gather there, I'll ask your sister, but I gather there's no dispute that the crime to which he pled guilty is not one which presumptively mandates removal from the United States. No, it's not. Uh, <coughs> so if he understood that, the instruction would have had no consequence on his decision. If he understood that the that the crime to which he was pleading guilty was not a crime that presumptively mandated removal. Exactly, Your Honor. <clears throat> what is his status right now? Where is he? He's in Bristol County House of Corrections in ICE custody. I'm sorry? He's in um, Bristol County ICE custody. So he's in ICE custody already? Yes. Meaning he completed his sentence? Yes. He <clears throat> completed his sentence in November and then was transferred to ICE custody. All right, and they're apparently waiting on us? No, they don't wait for... I was going to say... <laughs> I wish uh, they would, but... Okay, so this is not a situation in which we have any control anymore about what... about his release to ICE. He's already been released to ICE. He's already been released to ICE, but certainly the outcome of, of this case will affect whether he gets deported or not. <clears throat> the, the, the procedural route is essentially... if. The immigration court enters an order of removal against him, and then it thereafter gets vacated. Then the, uh, he can file a motion in immigration court, basically, to reopen the proceedings. Um, the question as to whether he should be removed or not. So, um, I, I guess the the, the question uh, the amicus brief makes a, a, an excellent argument as to why the Rule 12 warning. Uh, is uh, more confusing and that we should get rid of the Rule uh, 12 warning. But what matters here is whether or not the defendant was warned of the contingency that happened, not any other language in 29D, warned of the contingency that, that, that could happen or happened. And um, absent some evidence that he realizes this isn't one of these aggravated felonies that presumptively uh, requires removal from the United States as suggested in Rule 12. What, what evidence is there to believe that this warning is inadequate? It sounds like it's a lot more of a sure thing that you're going to be uh, deported. And I, and, and I say that recognizing that the actual Rule 12 warning only care, probably covers a sliver of, of overall pleas. So in, in the real world of this case, where is there a sense that he was not adequately informed of the warning that might actually result in deportation? Well, if we look at 12, uh, 3B, it, it conditions the inevitability of deportation on the fact that the offense is one that presumptively mandates removal. We can't assume that uh, that he was informed that it, it, it doesn't say this offense presumptively mandates removal. It says if this is an offense that presumptively mandates removal, and we can't assume that he he knew that that uh, what what type of offense is what type of offense is. He was certainly concerned enough to lie about it, to lie about his immigration. I mean his uh, citizenship. He, he didn't lie about it. I don't think that that goes to anything other than the fact that he was concerned about immigration consequences. That does mean, not mean that he knew what the immigration consequences were. It, it speaks to his concern generally about immigration consequences. It, it puts him on notice though, right? I mean, I mean the, the statutory notice is very vague. It just says this may potentially have immigration consequences. His situation is so complicated given his multiple offenses. Isn't the rule essentially giving him the same notice? Um, I understand if it were, it, it's too specific, but at the same time it's saying, you know, this may have immigration <coughs> consequences. In fact, you're in real trouble, essentially. And, and I thought it was that it's, his offense may actually fit within the first part, it's just not 
practically inevitable that he's going to be deported. I thought he actually meets the first part of this, but not the second part, based on the CPCS immigration brief. Well, I, I think the offense itself, assault with a dangerous weapon, is not one that presumptive. I thought, though, because he has other offenses, and if you look at his history, he may actually, <coughs> his offense may fall within this category, but it's not practically inevitable that he's going to be deported. Well, it, it, does, it does make him removable, but because he had prior crimes involving moral turpitude. He had a prior conviction for a so crime. So doesn't involved. that make that offense a presumptive one of those? It's just that he's not practically inevitable that he's going to be deported. The whole thing is you need an immigration lawyer to figure this out, and a damn good one. Um, but isn't he on notice that he's got immigration consequences here? And then when he misleads the judge and says, I'm not even an immigrant, are we really reversing in that context? Well, I, th I think, again, we can't focus on um, we can't focus on whether the defendant knew that immigration consequences were a possibility or not. Even if he did, if that warning is not given, I think the statute requires that the defendant be entitled to withdraw his plea. Well, the sta we, we've said that you don't have to give it word for word, right? Yes. We've also said in Hilaire that the other, the green sheets are not enough. Um, but we're starting to, you know, split hairs here as opposed to, is he on notice that there are immigration consequences? It, it, it seems hard to believe that unless he's a brilliant immigration lawyer, he doesn't worry that he has immigration consequences here. Well, then I, 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 again, I think that we get to the point where 29D is essentially irrelevant. If, if, if uh, a judge, the, say a judge never gives a warning, then does all the Commonwealth need to do to satisfy 29D, come back in on a motion hearing and say, well, you, sir, you were generally aware of immigration consequences, right? And if he says yes, then... Um, Isn't that what the statute does? It says, look, this may have immigration consequences, including deportation, blankety blank and blankety blank. Isn't that a, I mean, isn't the essentials all given here? I don't think so because the, again, the, the plea that the, uh, the 3B warning, the one that's actually given, conditions this result upon this being a type of offense, whereas the 29D warning does not condition it on any type of offense. It says, any, any defendant here, any f defendant in front of the court who's tendering a plea might result in immigration consequences. And that's why the, the, uh, the scope of it is broader. And I think also the, co the court has to rem remember that this is a statutory analysis. And I think that Villa Lobos is, it, it's somewhat the inverse of this case, but I think it's, um, it's very relevant because in Villa Lobos, the warning itself was actually misleading. And so in that case, the, the, the defendant's knowledge is he's been misled, essentially. Yet the court says, because the judge followed the statute, the defendant's not entitled to withdraw his plea. So I think that case is, is another strong, um, it along with Hilaire, essentially establishes that, look, it does not come down to the defendant's actual understanding of his immigration consequences. It comes down to, did the judge comply with the statute? Do the warnings supplied by the judge comply with the statute? And I think that that analysis has to narrowly focus on the scope of the warning itself. So even if he understood perfectly, it wouldn't make any difference? I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think it would make any difference. Focus is not on him, it's on the, uh, whether the, it's on the warning itself? Yes, I think it's gotta be on the warning itself. And it, again, Villa Lobos makes that quite clear because they are the defendant um, is in fact misled by the warning, and you could say that he, he clearly does not understand um, the potential consequences. Yet, judge followed the warning, so the plea had to be, um, the, the plea was legitimate, and he could, was not entitled to withdraw his plea. All right, thank, thank you. Thank you. Ms. Knight. Good morning, may it please the court. Aaron Knight on behalf of the Commonwealth asking this court to affirm the motion judge's denial of the defendant's motion to withdraw his pleas. 
I'd like to start where uh, my brother kind of left off with the argument as to the particular defendant in this case. The defendant in this case actually received exactly what ended up applying to him and applied to him at the time of the plea. This, the charge of um, assault with a deadly weapon was his second crime of moral turpitude. Looking at his uh, Board of Probation report, that would have been quite clear um, under the terms of the federal statute. So this being the second crime of moral turpitude, separate and apart from the first, and after five years that he's been in the country, qualified him for deportation. So here, the presumptively mandatory removal language of 3B did apply to him, and he actually got the warning to but which- But the second part doesn't apply, right? He's not, it's not practically inevitable because he doesn't fit within the other category, right? At least, it seems like the immigration lawyers at CPCS have taken this to the second part of that, and he doesn't meet the second part that it's practically inevitable. Well, I think that anything under- Can you just address whether that's right or not? Because- Sure. Um, I'm not exactly sure if that is right, because I think under 8 U.S.C. 1227, the immigration statute, anything listed, especially under um, the 237A to A part, is practically inevitable to the extent that those are the crimes that the federal government tends to focus the most on. That's where you're going to find the drug offenses, the firearm offenses, the aggravated felonies, and the crime of moral turpitude. And I think, the two crimes, I'm sorry, of moral turpitude. And so I think that the practically inevitable language actually does apply in this case because I think he was. Although, don't they do statistics on, they, they, there's another part of the brief that does the statistics saying that no, it isn't practically inevitable. Actually, a lot of these guys don't get deported. I think it's definitely a case-by-case -case basis, um, but I think here where he also had other um, convictions on his record that were going to go towards. Are you arguing that he got a more harsh warning? I think he did. I think the 3B language is narrower in scope than the 29D language, but at the same time, the, the 3B language gives the purpose of the 2090 statute. The 3B language may explain that it's presumptively inevitable. However, they gave the, it gives the three enumerated consequences, which all of the case law, Hilaire, Soto, uh, Berthold, they all say is the purpose of that statute. The purpose of the statute is to put the defendant on notice of those three immigration consequences. But the, the, the judge violated here both the rule and the statute, did she not? Technically, yes, because she didn't give uh, three A. She yes. didn't give, I mean, the, the rule says you should give A and B, but and the does, commentary makes clear that you're required to give both. The case law, the interpretation by this court and the appeals court is that the precise language is not necessary. And in fact, I think that's even more so exemplified by the fact that this statute was amended after Villa-Lobos in 2004, and without really adjusting any of the language besides adding in the admission language, the legislature essentially adopted the court's holdings that the language is, it doesn't need to be precise, it's the three enumerated consequences. But, but that have matter. we ever, have we ever, where the legislature expressly says that you shall vacate the judgment if you do not advise the defendant as it has put in quotes, have we ever permitted anything which de deviates as much as this does from the language of? of section 29D. Yes, and in fact, in these which, cases- which, which case do you say that the actual instruction deviated as much as this did? Sure, so in Lamrini, for instance, uh, that's a Mass App Court case, the defendant actually didn't even get the um, full war three warnings, but she was advised of her consequence from which she suffered. And while they said that the language was barely adequate, it was in fact still adequate, and they held that she was, um, given what she it, Didn't the judge actually in that case just say, um, you know, the possibility of being deported because of these charges? Correct, and, and she charges, was, I think, was the word. The charges. The, the issue in Lamarini was charges versus conviction, but they still upheld it because she was advised she was going to be deported. She could be deported. Lamarini is a 27 mass app case, right? It is, it, but there's also um, Kamala versus Soto, where the defendant was not warned he could be excluded from admission, and that's what happened, and that's why they reversed the case, was because he was not told he'd be excluded from admission. He received denial of naturalization and deportation, but not exclusion from admission. Okay, I'm trying to find cases which depart as much as this did, and apart from Lam Rainey, which is a mass app court 
Well, decision. Berthold, which is 441 Mass 183 from 2004, the judge did not give a complete 29D warning. He failed to advise about reentry, but he did warn about deportation, and that was the defendant's claim in that case. And, and, we, and we reversed. That, well, that case, I... We vacated the... I mean, I'm, I'm trying to find cases where we actually said we're not going... that the language of the statute is not going to require us to vacate the judgment and permit the defendant to withdraw the plea. I, I don't believe... Berthold does say that the inadequacy complained of is immaterial to the harm for which the remedy is sought, then you do not have to um, reverse based on the 29D language. And I think... I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you were asking a question. Um, I think that this, is the ex this case falls exactly into that. Berthold says, because the defendant was warned of the precise immigration consequence that he subsequently faced, the motions to withdraw his guilty pleas were properly denied. That's because he was warned that he was um, eligible for deportation or could be based on that plea, and that is exactly what happened. And that's what happened here. He was warned that he would be eligible for deportation. In fact, he was given a heightened warning that would make one stop and think a, possibly a little bit more with that practically inevitable language, and that's what happened. So if you're right, we would have to make a factual determination that indeed this particular crime is one that presumptively mandates removal from the United States? I don't think you have to make that finding here because I think it's clear that it's not, it was not just that one charge standing alone that would have been presumptively removable. That is true. In fact, I think it doesn't become an aggravated felony until he's actually sentenced um, because he did receive a quaff in this case. Um, but I think that given the situation of this particular defendant, he got exactly what he needed to hear during this plea. <coughs> so we would have to make a determination first that it was right that he get this plea. You would, I, I think you would have to make the determination that yes, he this was correct in this instance. Because um, because you were right about the the nature of the. Or, because the nature of the statute, the purpose of the statute is to put him on notice of what he is going to, what he could potentially be um, suffer from as consequence, and that is what he received here. So if you're right. Why do we bother to say give both? Because it sounds as if yeah, so it's always going to be sufficient to give only one, even though we expressly said you have to give sure, the first. Sure. So my understanding of the enactment of 3B, the rule 3B, was to put defendants on a heightened notice in particular circumstances, where um, 8 U.S.C. 1227, those crimes are so general, it's hard to pinpoint exactly um, what would put the defendant on notice. While it's not the judge it's not up to the judge to determine whether or not um, such a crime or such a conviction would qualify. I think the three B notice um, was put in just to kind of heighten that expectation. However, I do think that the three B uh, rule is in fact confusing when coupled with the twenty ninety or three A language that says maybe. Um, so I think that in actuality, the best case moving forward, I don't think it applied here because he got exactly uh, what he needed, but I think moving forward would be to give only the 29D or 3A language instead of the 3B because I think standing up there listening to both at the same time could be a bit confusing as to where the defendant actually falls under. Isn't um, that for the legislature to figure out though? That's, that's not for us. Well, I think, well, the rule was promulgated by this court, and so I think that the legislature having um, left the 29D warning essentially alone since the court's been interpreting these cases as it has been um, with uh, Berthold and um, the Soto and then the lower court, or the mass app court with Lamrini and Agbogan. And as cases of that nature, I think they've essentially adopted how the court's been interpreting that notice requirement. So I think going back to the 3B language, um, I think that it w is essentially confusing to give both because you're giving basically the same exact recitation twice if you're to read them verbatim. You're giving them same recitation twice except for that uh, practically inevitable or may language. Can I go back to Justice Gaziano's point, which is the, the warning here was more extreme. So he was, it's not quite accurate, but it's actually telling him he's in more danger. Absolutely. Does that does that, how does that play when it's not quite right, it's not Berthold right mm -hmm. on the money, but actually it's saying you could be in more trouble if you ex 
take the guilty plea? I think, if anything, that sets off more alarm bells, that if the defendant hasn't talked to their uh, lawyer about this, if they haven't been fully advised as to if this falls under that language, then there's that uh, issue that it's practically inevitable. I think that given that language of being more severe than a May language, a more general language, would tend to put the defendant on higher notice that this is more so a possibility. I think given the three enumerated consequences, any defendant would be wondering, especially a non-citizen obviously, um, am I going to qualify for this? And I think with that practically inevitable language, it gives a little bit more of a this is, a ser this is serious, this may happen, um, or this is in fact um, <coughs> quite possibly going to happen. So I think in that heightened analysis, that would put any defendant m on more notice than the 29D language would. But, but our rule didn't say where that you can give B alone. It says you have to give A and B. I believe it does say that both are required, but when you violate a rule, the procedural rule, it's not an automatic um, issue. I think here... But when you violate the statute, it is. Focusing on the 29D, but again, going back to those cases that have interpreted the statute and how the legislature has um, interpreted that statute and not amending it further is the fact that the notice is what's required, the notice of the three uh, enumerated consequences, and especially the consequence from which the defendant suffers. And that is, in this case, that is what happened. And if there are no further questions, come on. <coughs> Thank you. We'll take a morning you. break.